Anyway, all right, so I guess uh, we're at the time. Uh, welcome everybody, my name is James. I am a physician assistant and I run PA Mentor. Uh, today we're gonna be, I guess our, today we have a PA that's gonna do virtual shadow with us. Her name is Sandra. Sandra's a gastroenterology and hospitals PA, but I'll let her just go ahead and take over from here. Hi everybody, um, it's uh, exciting to be here with everybody. My name is Sandra Delay. So, um, yeah, I am a physician assistant for the past 11 years, almost 12 years. So, uh, and it's been great. I started out as an MA, a medical assistant, and um, I just, uh, you know, started in this clinic with this amazing neurosurgeon, amazing neurosurgeon uh, PA uh, that really inspired me. And um, he just, you know, he was such an, a great inspiration and really, really encouraged me to continue to, you know, um, not stop there because, I mean, I've always loved medicine. And um, the reason I didn't, you know, pursue medicine was because I just uh, come from a background, you know, just a little bit about myself. Um, my parents are uh, pretty underserved and didn't have the means or the you know, for them was, why are you going to college in the first place? Just go ahead and, you know, work. We need the money. So that's basically why I, I just said, okay, let, let me work. Let me start something, you know, that it's a fast, you know, like a short uh, um, career. And I thought, okay, that's where I'm going to stop. Nope. James Kimber just, you know, really inspired me. And I just, you know, I said, you know what, I'm going to apply. I did, that was, I applied to only one PA program and that was Stanford. That's where I wanted to go because it was, you know, just, I mean, it was, for me, it was like the best thing, right? Um, at that point, you know, I never knew what a PA was until I met James. So, um, and I started, you know, my, my job as an MA. Um, so I applied and I got in first time in, you know, that was great. I, uh, it was nerve wracking. I mean, it, it's, it's always very, uh, you know, um, an, it's an exciting moment, you know, when you're applying and just waiting for that moment that they tell you, hey, you made the interviews. And then you go through the interviews and you're like, oh man, like, are they gonna like me? Or, you know, it's, it's, it's it's just you know i i totally relate if you're nervous about it if you're you know looking into it, it's the best thing ever you know it's totally worth the whole hassle and um and i i went through the whole program and and here i am you know i started as a cardio with cardiology at first my first couple of years um i started as cardiology then i went into gi um which i've been doing gi for the past 10 years already um gi has just uh i've i've loved gi you know i, I it, when i was a student i remember saying oh gi is super easy it's not really i like the challenge so i said mm, no one of our um one of the doctors that i i shadowed uh he said how about you continue to do gi with me and then you tell me and then you know he hired me you know i said yeah i love it he hired me and so now I've been, a, you know, with him for the past 10 years. Um, I was also rounding with him in the hospital. So now, you know, I said, oh, this is something that I, you know, grew to love. And now I'm a hospitalist, you know, and doing internal medicine for the past three years, three, almost four years. So it's been a wonderful journey for me. And that's a little bit about myself. <laughs> Okay, and I forgot to mention for all those of you attending, if you do have any questions, uh, I guess just raise your hand, but I also want to introduce one of our students that we worked with this year. Uh, she just got accepted. Well, actually just a few months back, she got accepted, um, but I'll go ahead and let her introduce herself. Um, hi, I'm Cassie. I'm going to Chapman's PA program starting this January, so I'll graduate in 2024. Um, that's about it. If you have any well, questions, let me know. Yeah, if you guys have questions, please raise your hand. But by the way, that's not it. Uh, Cassie is also going on a full scholarship. So congratulations, Cassie. You, you really earned that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Very excited. <laughs> okay, so I'll be talking about pancreatitis. So pancreatitis, basically, it's inflammation of your pancreas. Um, the pancreas, a little bit of what the pancreas does, 
it uh, makes enzymes, right, and sends it to the small intestines, helps with the breakdown of food. So just a little bit of uh, what the pancreas does so you can have a better understanding. So we have a 47-year-old male with sudden onset of abdominal pain radiating to the back. Um, <clears throat> a bit about, about the history, um, obese, um, and excessive alcohol use, so heavy alcohol. Complaints also uh, with nausea, uh, which is associated with the pain as well. On exam, you will um, notice that a patient has abdominal tenderness, mainly in the upper and the epigastric region. However, it, it, it does radiate to the rest of the abdomen. It can be pretty diffuse as well. Um, he's tachycardic, which is associated with the pain as well. Hypotensive could be, you know, also in cases where, you know, the uh, acute or the sudden onset of uh, uh, um, the pain or pancreatitis can go ahead and um, make a, you know, become severe. So we have here, this is uh, what we call a Grace Turner um, <clears throat> sign. This, you typically don't see it, um, com it's not really common. You tend to see it more when it is a severe case of um, pancreatitis to the point of necrotizing. So you're, you're, you're more concerned when you see that sign because now you know, okay, this is something really uh, emergent and, and the mortality rate tends to go up with this. So you, you act a little more, you know, um, quicker when it comes to this. You see here the imaging, this is a CT scan, it's normal pancreas. And you compare it here, now you can, you're able to see the pancreas more <clears throat> inflamed, very angry at this point. So treatment. <clears throat> so the patient comes to the hospital, you know, severe pain. We give them, the first thing to do is IV fluids. We push fluids, um, aggressive fluids. We put them on lactate ringers, uh, 250 cc's, and you know you just want to flush them out. Um, keep them nothing by mouth. Um, antibiotics, it is uh, controversial. So um, initially, we try not to give the antibiotics, you know, unless we see that this uh, pancreatitis can come, you know, uh, become severe. So we kind of, you know, hold off initially, but then, you know, eventually the patient will be placed on um, antibiotics. Uh, pain medications, of course, uh, you know, we need to make the make sure the patient is nice and comfortable. So we give uh, IV morphine um, and, you know, pain control is important. Oral uh, pain medications are added on as, you know, as the patient becomes uh, better and tolerates uh, the um, meals. So we start basically the patient on clear liquid diet. Once the patient is uh, able to tolerate the clear liquid diet, then we go ahead and advance as tolerated, and we include these pain medic oral pain medications and wean them off the IV medication. Ideally, for a hospitalization of pancreatitis, uh, we see them getting better within 24 to 48 hours. Um, we keep them nothing by mouth for that amount of time. We studies have shown that the more we tend to um, advance the diet quicker rather than later, we encourage the patient to ambulate. And um, so that way the patient is able to, you know, recover uh, quicker and um, making sure that the, uh, of course, the pay, the medication, pain medication is uh, working for the patient. <clears throat> for this um, uh, ERCP, so possible ERCP. So what are the main reasons of pancreatitis? Main reasons, more common, of course, in this case, the patient is alcohol. So that is the very, very common. We see it often in the hospital. Um, alcoholic, uh, heavy alcohol, and um, it tends to really um, get the pancreas angry. And when we start talking about ERCPs, because now, is it only the alcohol? Another very common um, reason for a um, pancreatitis is gallstones. So the gall gallstones um, really block those ducts, the pancreatic duct, causing those enzymes to not be released. 
So now the pancreas becomes inflamed. So at this point, um, the patient, we do an MRCP. So it's an MRI, but really dedicated to have a better vi vi visual or imaging of the bile ducts. Um, if the bile ducts seem to be dilated, then we go ahead and um, say, okay, most likely um, there is either a stone that has passed or a stone that is blocking. So we bring in, you know, GI in this case, um, and uh, further assess with an ERCP, which is a endoscopically, we will further evaluate the bile ducts. And if the bile duct is blocked with the stone, then it is endoscopically removed at that point. Um, <clears throat> And if, of course, the gall gallbladder with stones, we bring in the surgery surgeons um, because the patient will likely need a cholecystectomy. Um, once the pancreas is uh, well under control and uh, patient stable, of course. So just a question I would have too is, sure. I know we wrote this up more like, you know, acute setting a hospital, but how would somebody like this maybe present in a outpatient setting, like say a family practice? <clears throat> Um, so outpatient in clinic, this patient usually has more of a chronic abdominal pain. So chronic meaning that um, the patient now has over three months, you know, of abdominal pain, epigastric pain. Um, this means the patient already um, has probably had several attacks of these, uh, you know, episodes of pancreatitis. Um, the patient just, you know, whenever they eat, they tend to have pain. Um, that is, you know, key, especially in a patient with a history of alcohol. And if the patient at this point, I, it's very common to see them coming back and they say, well, yeah, I still drink, you know, I'm still taking eight to 10 shots of tequila, you know, in spite of all the, you know, patient education, please, you know, start cutting back, please, you know, um, they still, you know, tend to do that. So um, having said that, uh, we give the education again, encourage them to stop drinking. Um, and um, of course, that's not only the only reason for, for pancreatitis, but in this case, I'm just using alcohol uh, as an example. It, the patient at this point will need um, help, right? Because once the pancre pancreatitis becomes more of a chronic uh, issue, we need to make sure that we help the pancreas to really release those enzymes because in, in chronic um, situations, it stops working. Um, so we need these enzymes. So we give uh, pancreatic enzymes to take. So usually two of these pancreatic enzymes, two capsules, uh, and we give them with meals three times a day. And if they have a snack, then they'll take one. And that tends to help them to break down, you know, the, the food. Mm -hmm. Colorectal cancer. So colorectal cancer. Um, we have this 72-year-old uh, female with unexplained weight loss, um, abdominal discomfort, change in stool consistency. On exam, abdominal tenderness, um, just pretty distended. So we, of course, um, we, uh, it's, she's 72, the patient, you know, needs a, a colonoscopy. She has not had a colonoscopy in the past 10 years, so definitely she is due for one. Uh, the past colonoscopy, she recalls uh, being normal. So that was probably her colonoscopy 10 years ago, and now these are her findings. So this is a, a mass now, pretty much a pretty, pretty good size right there. So for uh, treatment, we sent the patient for, um, of course, surgery because um, that is a size that it's it can it can be really completely removed. So when we're doing um, when a colonoscopy is uh, done, we're able to take or remove the the polyp depending on the size. That size it's already become you know pretty it's a mass. So we take biopsies and the biopsies are sent out for pathology to really confirm the cancer and the type of uh, a cancer of course and then we refer to surgery uh, to make sure um, and there is a um, what we call tattooing so we tattoo that mass to make sure that the surgeon knows exactly where 
that mass was uh, located um, and they're able to remove it uh, surgically. Sometimes, you know, um, unfortunately, they, they might be uh, having a part of the colon resected. Uh, we also send for oncology uh, evaluation and make sure that, you know, the patient is taken care of at that point. Prevention, education. So um, diet, it's very, very important. Uh, we see uh, a lot of these, um, the risk factors, right? Um, it is uh, diet, it's very important. Uh, alcohol, you gotta stop drinking, you know, alcohol in excess, smoking. Smoking is one of our biggest um, um, risk uh, factors for, for colorectal cancer. Of course, all the older uh, age, um, in this case, it's a, a um, this patient is over the age of 50. Uh, however, you know, we are seeing a lot of the younger population uh, with uh, colorectal cancers. So, um, and that is the reason now we are, instead of having, you know, a colorectal um, uh, screening uh, for patients over the age of 50, now it's over the age of 45. Uh, whereas before uh, uh, it was only meant for African-Americans because they are also a um, higher risk population. So now it's everybody over the age of 45. Of course, if you have a history of polyps in the past, that puts you at a higher risk of colorectal cancer. Also um, having inflammatory bowel diseases, um, such as ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, um, this also puts you at a, at a higher risk of um, a colorectal cancer, so. And I just discussed the risk factors okay. and uh, the early screening. And you and I were talking before about how there's a study out recently that was a little misleading when it comes to colon cancer and screening. Yeah, uh, recently there was, I want to say it was CNN. Uh, there was a, a study and they were uh, pretty much stating that uh, based on that study, um, the uh, colorectal screening was not as effective as what we all think. Pretty misleading because, I mean, um, this this study it was uh, based on um, I can't recall the numbers and I'll look it up for you guys so that you you know maybe James can post it, um, but it's basically if you have a hundred uh, patients right nobody is gonna they're not gonna talk about the full study they're gonna talk about what the findings were and oh based on this number so if it, there's a hundred you know um, participants but not all a hundred show up and only 20, so they'll say, oh, only 20 out of 100. And that was basically CNN was saying, you know, so therefore it's not as, you know, it's not really uh, an effective type of testing or screening. So bottom line, no, uh, colonoscopies are still uh, the most sensitive type of uh, screening that we can have for colorectal cancer. Um, it's It really prevents, you know, um, uh, patients from, from uh, having, to die from colorectal cancer. It is one of the leading causes of uh, cancers right now in the United States. Um, we are seeing it more in the younger population. Uh, there's a lot of type of screenings, yes, and colorectal and uh, colonoscopies are still the most sensitive uh, type of testing for that. Uh, just briefly, uh, there are other tests um, like uh, the DNA um, testing of uh, the stool that is, I think, Cold Guard is called. Um, that one, you know, yes, it's great because you don't have to go through all the prep, you don't have to go through all the deal of a colonoscopy, right? So um, it is great. However, it's not as sensitive as the colonoscopy. It catches those uh, large adenomas or uh, the uh, cancerous uh, cells, but it's because it's already pretty pretty much advanced. So by the time they test positive, they still, patients still have to have the colonoscopy. So, you know, um, we still have to get in there. Uh, it's also given us a, a lot of false positives. Now, having said that, it's a great test. I'm not saying it's not. Um, you can still have that test, you know, have a screening colonoscopy in three years, depending on the, your fineness of the colonoscopy, you can have a, a cologuard, you know, absolutely, five years in between, you know, the 10 year mark. That's, you know, that's great. Uh, we also have the, we're trying to get away from that, um, it was the fecal cold blood test. Mm -hmm. That one, it's just, um, it, it gives a lot of false positives to begin with, mm -hmm. um, because, you know, a lot, it's very common to have hemorrhoids, right? So when you're doing these tests, 
these hemorrhoids can bleed. And so it can, you know, be detected microscopically and then, oh, it's a positive fecal cold blood test. And now we go and what, what happens after that, they come to the GI clinic and we set them up for a colonoscopy anyways. So, you know, it's, it's ultimately bottom line, you know, it is a, a great form of, you know, uh, preventative care, uh, screening colonoscopy still, you know, saves lives and that is what is important, so. A question would be, sure. I know we talk to the students a lot about barriers that arrive are in healthcare and you know people maybe from different backgrounds who mm -hmm. they're not familiar with these kind of tests or it's that you know if everything's fine why should I even have this test so do you ever mm -hmm. run into people maybe from certain backgrounds or how do you go about talking to them about getting something done that they think is unnecessary because they're not having a problem right so I do have that. It's very common, especially I do work in an underserved area um, and I do have all this population. The good thing right now is that we, the primary care um, is uh, working together as a team in the, in the area to educate you know all these um all these patients they do come to us and the first thing when they come to clinic is you know their their first screening colonoscopy and i say okay what's the reason you know for your visit today um well they said that i needed a test but i don't really know why so my insurance is telling me that i need that test too but i really don't know why I don't have any symptoms, you know, I don't have abdominal pain, I don't have any changes in my stool. Um, I really don't need it, you know. The patient's already 60, has never had a colonoscopy in the past. Um, then I, I, you know, then we get into the, you know, educated ed education part where I explain to them, no, um, I, it's great, you're not having any symptoms, that is great. Um, and that is why this is a screening colonoscopy, you know, because we are trying to make sure that before it becomes a problem, we check that colon. The polyps start to develop, um, you know, and they don't cause any symptoms in the early stages. They, um, you know, they're, the symptoms usually start when the polyp starts to grow and these abnormal cells start to develop um, and so now we, it becomes a problem we don't want to have a colonoscopy when there is a problem we want to have a colonoscopy before it becomes a problem many patients might have you know multiple polyps and these polyps can all be removed and taken care of right there and then through a colonoscopy um, before it becomes you know malignant most of these um, polyps are Pre, um, cancerous and um, so now we can say hey you know you had these polyps you know and it got taken care of before it actually turned into colorectal cancer so yeah so I know a lot of students they want to know just what is a typical day so for you I mean you do hospitalists you do GI so tell us just a little bit about a typical day for both if you don't mind sure so typical day I'll start with a GI clinic so my GI clinic, um, I start at 9 a.m. So it's like always a nice, you know, I wake up, get ready, go to a clinic. I There's coffee waiting, so I get coffee. Um, I go through my, usually my list, my, my patient uh, list is about of um, a good 30 patients per day. So um, I look over, okay, how's my list? Okay, we're good, you know, and um, say hello to everybody, the whole staff, and just, you know, it's always, I think, important to, you know, uh, kind of give yourself at least half an hour um, to just kind of, you know, walk around, make sure that everything's in place. Um, if there's any of the first uh, patients, you've got to make sure that you talk to your staff, of the MA, is there any imaging pending, anything on these patients so that we are not, you know, wasting time in the during the visit and we have everything ready to go. So um, then I, you know, once nine o'clock hits, patient gets roomed and you're hoping that the patients are roomed on time, but it doesn't always happen, you know. <laughs> um, patients, uh, usually we do have two to three providers. 
um, in the clinic. Uh, we do have six to seven rooms available, so we each take two rooms. So um, the patient um, follow-up time for in our clinic, every clinic is different for us, is 15 minute time slots. So every 15 minutes, I, you know, that's, I don't take 15 minutes. I take longer than 15 minutes, just so you know, because it takes a lot to educate the patient, especially when you're following up. When you see a patient and it is a first consult, it's way easier because you're pretty much just getting to know the patient and what do you need? So do you need an endoscopy? Depending on what the patient is um, needing, then you just give them, you know, the orders for the procedures. If it is a follow-up, now you have to go into detail what the findings were of whatever was ordered and now and labs and, you know, so it becomes a little more, um, uh, you know, a little more time consuming. Um, so I do tend to take my time to, regardless if it's a 50 minute follow up appointment or not. Um, then, you know, my day uh, lunch, I mean, if I have time to, to get some lunch, I, I, I don't go out because I will not have time to go out, uh, but I will have some time to kind of, you know, at least 15 minutes in between just to, you know, and again, that is because I do take my time with my patients, you know, um, other providers have their own style and you will develop yours as well. Um, and um, and then I, I do my afternoon. I finish around at 5.30ish. And so that is my typical day of clinic. I, you know, close everything and say, see you tomorrow, you know, and start all over for a hospital. That's different. So for hospital, I, you know, it is a day where I, I I'm about 45 minutes away. Um, no, 20 minutes away, but with traffic, it's 45 minutes to an hour to get to, to the hospital where I work at. So um, I start at seven. Um, between 7, 7.30ish, I need to be there. I, again, pull up my, my list. Usually for hospital, um, I, you know, tend to, on average, have 15 patients to start with. Um, and 15 patients, it's, you know, pretty pretty uh, big load. Uh, remember, we start with that amount of uh, patients. However, we will get admissions throughout the day. So um, I get my my patients. I start to know, you know, open their charts, make sure that I know their uh, why they're here, uh, their diagnosis, um, get ready for rounds, basically. So it takes me a good, you know, an hour and a half, uh, take notes, and then I start my rounds. I round for about two hours. Uh, then I have to go to a meeting to discuss discuss with the, you know, uh, the team, um, case managers, uh, physical therapists, um, you know, everybody needs to be on the same page and get to know, you know, the, um, the patient and what the plan is for discharge. That's what they want to know pretty much, you know, when are you going to discharge this patient? Um, then we, I go ahead and, you know, uh, start doing reports. Now, mind you, as I am working on the reports of each patient that I have seen and placing the orders and medication or whatever they need, we have nurses that are constantly messaging you throughout the day. This is about, if I stop looking at my phone for 10 minutes, I, you know, look at my phone, happen to look at my phone and I already have like 20 messages. So it's a constant, you know, so in between, oh, the patient needs this, the patient needs that. So it is more of a fast pace, even though, you know, you're not on a schedule, it is more fast pace. You need to be on top of everything, plus the IV fluids, plus this. Now we have codes and uh, we run the codes as well. So if you have those 15, you know, patients plus, and one of your patients is, uh, you know, uh, very, sick, you have patients in the ICU too, and you have patients in the, you know, PCU. So if these patients are sick and um, the the nurse happens to call a code, you know, rapid response, you know, then we are it. That's my patient. We They call it, you know, and we're, okay, it's not like we're going to turn around. It's like, oh, you know, who's going to go? No, that's your patient. You run to that code. So it becomes a little hectic day, you know, and that has happened where I'm there and you think everything's going to run smooth. No, you know, then you have codes. And then once one code starts, then it can happen again, you know, throughout the day. Um, then we have the admission. So when the admissions come, you get notified. You have an admission. Can you take this patient? You um, call the emergency department and, you know, to kind of um, get the information, the background on this patient. You go downstairs to the emergency department and you 
you know, take the uh, history from that patient and then you admit the patient officially to the hospital. Um, so that's all I do. And um, we end about 7 p.m. So and then get home like around 8 p.m. Try to, you know, have some dinner if you if you have time and start all over. And oh, <laughs> my shifts usually are uh, six to seven days straight, 12 hour shifts. Uh, to, so, yeah, it can get pretty. Uh, it's it's exciting though. It gets exciting. I love it. I mean, I've been there for three to four years uh, with just internal medicine. Before that, I was doing rounding, um, just GI. So it is a, a it's a balance. It's a good balance between clinic setting and hospital setting. And I I think you know that's it's the best of both worlds. And and I get to have that. So yeah. Mm -hmm. it's awesome. tell, tell me that last part again. How many days in a row do you work? I work. So Six to or, seven days in a row, 12 hour yeah. shifts. Yep. Mm -hmm. And that's not counting when I'm not in a hospital. No, I'm in I know. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. Uh, it just, it's funny because like students always talk about, I want to be a PA because of the work life balance. I'm like, oh, mm -hmm. hey, well, <laughs> you may want to observe a few more PAs to learn what that work life balance is. So. Yes. All right. Yes, definitely. Definitely. So, Kathy, do we have any questions? Not that I can see. I didn't see anyone's hand. Let me double check again. No, I have a question. Oh, can I ask a question? Of course. <laughs> okay. So, you said you worked in cardiology for three years, right? Before two years. Mm -hmm. Two. Okay. Was the transition really hard? Did you feel like you were starting all over again when you switched to GI? Yes. Yes, it, it, it did feel like I was starting all over. Um, I had no GI experience whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And cardiology, you know, when you, it's, you, I thought it was the most challenging, you know, so that is the reason I went into cardiology, but it, it's actually not, you, it's just the heart, you know, is, you know, it's going to be the heart. GI, you don't know where it's coming from. You have an abdominal pain. Okay. Is it your gallbladder? Is it your stomach? Do you have an ulcer? Do you have, you know, it just becomes a lot more of an investigation for you. So that makes it a lot more fun for me. You know, everybody, as you make your, you go through your rounds, your shadowing and, you know, your rotations, you'll see, you know, okay, I feel like I'm here. Primary care, um, it, 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 it is, um, something that I wanted to do. That's that I thought I was going to do primary actually, you know, I never thought cardiology. Um, uh, but at the time that I was, I was interviewing, all my interviews were actually for primary care, um, setting. And, um, I only had this interview for a cardiologist. And so he just, you know, painted the world for me. And, um, you know, so I said, okay, I took that opportunity, uh, you know, but I just, you know, I really enjoy cardiology as well. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions from anybody? All right. Um, now, for those of you who didn't hear, maybe you joined later, didn't, um, Sandra was a medical assistant. So um, I was listening when you were talking about when you come into the clinic and in your mornings, your little setup, making sure everything's run. It's not like you, the, the old MA in you. Um, yes. <laughs> But I don't know if you remember what I used to tell you when you were an MA. Which, um, when are you going to quit? Yes. I. <laughs> when are you going to quit, Sandra? When yes. are you going to quit? When are you going to go back to school and stop this nonsense? You don't need, you're too, you're too good to be an MA. And <laughs> one day you surprised me. You say, okay, I'm quitting. Like, what do uh -huh. I tell Dr. Tantawaya? <laughs> Yes. It's not my fault. Don't tell it was me. <laughs> Don't tell it was me. It was totally you. <laughs> yeah. Sandra, good morning, Sandra. How are you? When are you going to quit? Good morning, Sandra. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I guess there's a question. We have a question. Yeah, I saw that. Um, it's anonymous. We don't know. Um, they said, how was your schedule in cardiology? Uh, my schedule in cardiology, I the time I would start clinic was 8 in the morning. Um, I would also round with cardiology, so in the hospital, but that was when the cardiologist was on call, then I would go with the, uh, the cardiologist. Um, we would pretty much, I would see the patient and then the cardiologist would follow. But um, typically it was an eight to five um, p.m. 
you know, kind of job. And it was uh, the, it was not as, um, typically on average was 25 patients per day. Um, and some days I had stress tests, you know, so it was more of a uh, balanced uh, kind of schedule. And then Maricela wants to know, how did you finance your way through PA school? Oh gosh, yes. So, <laughs> um, I had, you know, I took out loans um, and I also had the help actually, I was very fortunate. My husband's in the military. So he um, did, uh, I did actually get to, to have some of that, um, what is it, his GI, um, G, uh, what's it the called, GI, James? Yeah, GI Bill. Yes, okay, GI Bill, yes. So um, I, I got to, uh, you know, have some of that, um, which helped otherwise, I mean, and I was also starving throughout my whole PA school, so. <laughs> Um, and then Ian said, this is perhaps a question for Cassandra. What was your PA journey like? Where did it start? Um, well, I actually made a list of things I didn't want to be in my freshman year of high school. Number one was medical field. Um, so it was not going towards medical field, but I took an anatomy class for fun my senior year, loved it. And then I became an EMT. So I worked as an EMT for about a year um, during community college. And then I transferred to Chapman. Um, decided I wanted to be PA because my sister's best friend was becoming one and I did research on it and then I worked as a medical assistant for almost two years and then this was my first year applying so I graduated two years ago um, so I took a gap I think it was a year and a half off and then I applied um, and then as soon as I got to Chapman I honestly didn't really apply finish my applications anywhere else um, I got one other interview to University of the Pacific but I said no because it was 12 hours and I didn't want to go through all of the nerves again, even though I knew I wanted to go to Chapman. So that's my story. <laughs> um, okay, let's see. Haley um, wants to know, what is the most common symptoms or diagnosis you see coming through the GI clinic? Most common symptoms. Um, right now, abdominal pain. So that is your most common symptom um, that a patient will walk in and say, I have abdominal pain. Now it's most likely lower abdominal pain that I've been seeing um, often in the past two years. It could be um, mostly intestinal. So um, we are having a lot more of the inflammatory bowel diseases versus um, irritable bowel syndromes. So we have to distinguish between both. Of course, they have to go through the whole workup um, and um, really you know, determine which one it is, is are you, so we rule out the inflammatory bowel disease first and make sure, is it um, a Crohn's or is it a ulcerative colitis? And depending on their symptoms, you know, if they are associated with uh, constip constipation or diarrhea, if it's diarrhea, we do the whole workup, make sure that we rule out any um, parasites, any type of, you know, infectious disease. Um, if it is more of a chronic diarrhea, uh, then, you know, we, we're still in both IBD versus IBS. So number one, to make sure that we confirm IBS in those cases is to make sure that we rule out the IBD first. Uh, we do blood work as well. Um, if, uh, if Is the patient, you know, possibly with celiac disease? Is the patient having um, any um, pancreatic enzymes that they're not, you know, producing? And then we go into pancreatic insufficiency. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, diagnosis. The most common uh, in this case is irritable bowel syndrome. We have a lot of patients with uh, that and, and we need to kind of manage and, and um, help them, educate them. And, and of course, uh, symptom control, supportive care, definitely. Hope that helps. And then Antonio wants to know the best way to expose yourself to various specialties prior to attending PA school. Definitely making sure that you have a good group of, of um, uh, a network. So um, if like in this case, you know, a shadowing uh, a program that will set you up with different types of PAs uh, within different specialties. So if you, you know, come across a PA that is, uh, say for example, my case, GI, and then I already have other friends that have, you know, uh, primary care. I have uh, internal medicine, I have um, uh, cardiology, I have OBGYN. So now 
you know, that student, I can refer and make sure that, you know, he gets exposed to all that, you know, within if they are within the, the region or the area. So basically trying to get in, in, in contact with a, a, um, uh, program or, um, you know, in this case, you know, this uh, wonderful program that James has, and you know, it's amazing because um, you are able to get that uh, proper mentoring and at the same time, the support that you need to make sure that you get exposed to different specialties and different, you know, just, you know, just so that you're well prepared, well rounded by the time you go to PA school. Um, if that's, you know, something that, um, uh, it, you know, I think it's, it's very useful. Um, I didn't, I, really didn't get too much into the shadowing when I was going to um, PA school at all. I basically neurosurgery was uh, was it for me. Um, but again, I was an MA, so I didn't it didn't really was required. And I think you'll get a lot more um, in detail when you um, get into the PA programs as well. But definitely a great idea to get that exposure before. And then Valerie wants to know how many patient contact hours you had when you applied. Oh, geez. Well, a lot. <laughs> no. I, because, um, well, as an MA, it can't, you know, I worked as an MA for uh, three years over. No, it was longer than that. A little over, yeah, I want to say five years, a good five years. So that counted as patient care, patient contact as well. Um, I had phlebotomy as well. So I had those hours, uh, patient care. Um, and, um, and then I would, you know, of course, I shadow with uh, James as well. So I had a, a, I don't, yeah, five years worth. So every day, <laughs> basically. A lot. <laughs> um, a lot. Ke yeah. Kezia asked, um, for Cassandra, how did you get a full ride scholarship to PA school? Um, so there is a man named Ron Simon and he, he d usually does undergrad and high schools, but he does full ride scholarships for students, um, usually first generation. So 99, I think 0.8% of the people who get it are first generation um, college students. And they did a partnership with Chapman's PA program. So it's the only grad school program that he does it with for five years. So I'm the third year. They pick 10 students out of 50 accepted and give them a full ride. Um, and so I'm in the third year, so they're doing it for two more years. Um, but it was, I had to do a whole other application. You had to get personal letters of recommendation. I had an hour and a half interview um, with two people from Chapman. It was very personal. It was, it was really comfortable. It was a fun process, but they asked you like, what gets you up in the morning? Um, stuff like that. So not a typical PA school program. Um, and then you have to, you can apply before you get accepted to Chapman, but obviously they're not going to interview you unless you get accepted. So I waited to get accepted. Um, but it's an awesome opportunity. So there's two more years of it. So you apply this year and next year, you can apply for the Simon scholarship, which is great. Um, and then Charmaine said, if you can turn back the clock and change one thing about your PA journey, what would it be? Um, let me see. It's been so great that it's it's hard to you know change anything because I think that everything that I went through, it served its purpose. Um, it was meant for something. It was meant for growth, um, even the most challenging uh, parts. But if it would be one thing that uh, throughout my PA journey, from even from uh, the time I was you know pre PA, um, I would say I would definitely be more comfortable with you know. Um, the sciences. So that's something that I would definitely just, uh, uh, you know, change. I would have been a little, uh, what would I say? It, it's, 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 I think, more knowledgeable, you know, when it came to that so that I wouldn't feel as stressed out because I think that was more challenging for me. I don't think that we, um, um, it was a fast paced program for us. So I I just needed to be a little more prepared when it came to those sciences, such as, you know, like the biology aspect, microbiology aspect, the whole, you know, I think I needed to be more prepared or, or have taken those um, classes closer to, or, you know, like a review type of uh, program. I think that's pretty much what I always say. I said, I just, 
feel that it would have been less stress. I would have been less stressed if I would have been a little more prepared um, going into the PA program. Um, and also um, having a little more um, exposure, I would say, um, to the um, other, you know, I, I think there was a question about, you know, maybe the all the, um, how about shadowing? I would have loved to do that. Maybe that's something that I would have changed. I would have loved to, to go and have a little more knowledge as to, you know, the other specialties. And um, because, you know, we go through all these specialties and just having a little more um, exposure, I think would have been great for me as well. Otherwise, I mean, my journey, I, it's so hard to say because my, I, I love every, every second, every minute of my, my PA journey throughout to this point, 11, 12 years after. And, and it is, you know, something that I never would regret. I love my job. I love what I do. It's very rewarding. It's, it's something that you want to wake up. It's something that you want to say, I'm doing this because I, this is what I love to do. I'm passionate about, and I am, and I just wake up every morning and say, it's not like another job. This is part of my life. Antonio um, wants to know, he said he's waiting for PA school admission decisions and what can he do in the meantime to prepare? In the meantime, um, so while you're waiting for these, uh, I know it's it's the waiting game, right? So it's, it's it can get pretty nerve wracking. Um, in the meantime, making sure that it, you are shadowing, um, that is that is important. So um, making sure that you are uh, preparing yourself with uh, patient care. You know, I'm not sure what um, what you're doing um, currently, but uh, if uh, just making sure that you are prepared to when you get those, you know, those acceptance letters. Um, I don't know, James. Do you have any any other what suggestions for him? What was the? Sorry, I didn't hear. It. He's waiting. He's waiting to see if he uh, got into PA school. So he's asking what he can do to prepare in the meantime. For next time. Yeah, or just yeah. He's, for he's waiting. In general. He's oh. waiting for his acceptance letters. He applied, and he's waiting for his admission letters to come back. Um, wait, I'm sorry. Has he had the interview? I guess I didn't understand. I don't know if he's had interviews. He's just waiting for decisions in general. And then he wants to know how to prepare. So I don't know if that means for the next round or just for school um, or in general. I mean, just if, you, if it came down to you're going to end up applying again for the cycle, there's just there's four things that you need to focus on, which is one, continuing your education, which is either repeating courses where you may not have done so well at or it's taking courses that you haven't done, whether it was O-chem, biochem, genetics, immunology, some of the sciences, upper sciences. It's obviously continue the patient care, but you may need to look at the patient care that your patient care experience hours you're obtaining. So it's not just to continue the hours you have, you may need to get into something that's a little bit more competitive. And then it's continuing your shadowing and volunteering. And these are things that we see often in applications that lack people just kind of let this go. They've got a few hours. They did it two years ago. They haven't done anything recently. And a lot of times these are factors that you have other candidates are doing all this, um, you know, keeping it up continuously, which is what you need to do to be a competitive applicant. So if that's what you're looking for in terms of what you need to do for next cycle, but Obviously, you know, the ultimate goal is you want to get to this point. <laughs> In any case, That's anybody doesn't know who that best is. Best feeling ever. <laughs> that is Sandra uh, many, many years ago. But, you know, the very interesting thing is she doesn't look any different in that picture than she does right now. Oh, you're so <laughs> kind. <laughs> Thank I'm you. Saying. Okay. Sorry. I had I'll to bring it there. Up. <laughs> it's a good thing. Cassie, I'll do that to you someday too. Okay. I, I hope I make it there. <laughs> you will. Okay. Oh, thank you. Kezia um, asked if you had to get a certification before becoming a medical assistant. Yes. 
Yes, you have to go to um, uh, to school. It's a it's a program. Uh, nine month nine months. I want to say nine month program, and uh, you get the um, it, it gives you like a little um, rundown of the whole. You know, pretty much. Uh, um, uh, you take uh, AMP, but it's like pretty basic form of the sciences as well. So, um, yeah, it's it's a something that I think that um, it helps because you do get that patient care and it helps to kind of understand what the medical field is all about, how a clinic gets run, you know. So it, it really did help me um, to, to have that understanding. And if I would, if I would have never done that, of course, I would have never met James and I would have never been, you know, a PA. So everything happens for a reason and I am so happy I went that route. Yeah, I think it's hard to, I didn't have my MA license, but I had my EMT and then obviously a bachelor's in science. And then I knew the PA, so they kind of snuck me in and a couple others, they are the same. They had either like a phlebotomy license or a scribe. Um, so they got in, but I know it's, I don't know anyone else that's been able to get a job without a license, but it's just kind of, if you, I guess, if you know someone. Um, okay. You know, I, I'll just jump in. I, I gotta, yeah. I don't remember what we did in your situation, but um i honestly do recommend getting a job as an ma for those who are not ma's and uh just some of the things we tell people is urgent care centers will hire now they'll they'll advertise that you have to be a certified ma but if you walk in the door present yourself have a have a current cv ready be surprised how many places will actually hire even though you don't have the certification if you have some kind of background if you have no background it's a different story, but like Cassie was saying, as an EMT or even a phlebotomist, a lot of times they will hire without that certification and urgent care is a great resource. That's true, actually. I do have three friends, I think, that add an urgent care um, that don't have their license either. Mine was a cardiology office, but I think because I was an EMT, they knew I had training in EKGs and stuff. Um, but yeah, urgent care is a good, good idea. Um, this one's anonymous, but it says, I'm worried about getting patient care experience after I graduate from college, especially as I have yet to do any yet. What would you recommend or advise me to do? I guess <laughs> up to you, James or Sandra. Uh, okay. I mean, it just simple is you're going to need, I mean, at least to meet the minimum that any school requires, whether that's some schools will say, you know, it's recommended not required just remember that if it said recommended but not required you're you're competing against several hundred sometimes thousands of other applicants so even if you had a 3.8 a 3.9 it's not going to compensate for other students i mean i i have a student this year she has a 3.01 actually a student 2.98 who did get in so you may be competing with a high gpa but if you don't have hours um as far as how many hours, obviously the more the better, but you, you need to have at least a bare minimum in my opinion. So if it says minimum of 250, that's what you need. 500, you need that. We'll take other things into consideration at the uh, admissions board, which is if you're a full-time student, if you're still a student or just coming out of school, you know, we, we look at that and think, you know, obviously you're not gonna have the average number that schools post that the typical student has. That being said, some students are just hard chargers. We had somebody last year when she applied, she was a senior in college and she her grades were stellar and she had almost 2000 hours during her college career. So people will say, I can't do it, I can't do it, it's okay. Other people will and not to be so blunt, but it just, they're gonna pick the best students just to get an interview and then out of the interview, then the best out of that. So it is very competitive, but there are ways to get hours. Just, um, I mean, it's a lot that I have to go into right now, but there are ways to get hours. So I, I'm, I'm sure that I didn't exactly answer your question, but um, you know, whether it's working as an EMT, whether it, I mean, there are like, ex, um, how do I say it? Like there are EMT programs that are accelerated. So you could always do something like, I know in the LA County, they offer like three week courses. So some places they have these accelerated courses. So you may not have to do something as lengthy as MA, CNA is good. Scribe is actually one of the more preferred backgrounds these days. More and more schools are recognizing mm -hmm.
how much exposure scribes have versus the MA who's in the, in the, you know, they meet with the patient, bring them in, they go back to the desk, whereas scribe is in the room. So scribe is a great way. And the train, I don't believe is nearly as long, but you do need some good solid hours. Um, so Ian, um, he just thanked you for everything for covering the session today. Thank you, James. Thank you, Sandra, Cassandra, for your insight. And then um, Valerie said, I'm a very non-traditional pre-PA student. I have an MPH, but not many patient contact experience hours. I'm working as a scribe part-time um, because I work in FT nine to five. And I'm also planning to apply to one program. Would having a master's already help my application at all? I mean, having the master's helps, but I'll tell you, when it comes to non-traditional, you know, I'll just tell you about a woman I worked with last year. She's 53 years old. She's an English teacher. So there's nothing wrong, non-traditional people who are nutritionists, occupational therapists, people who are nurses, uh, foreign doctors. I have people who've never even been in healthcare. Kind like of last year, he was what do you do? He did ski patrol during the winter, and then he kayaked down the Grand Canyon. And he just basically a tour guide, but Having the master's, it does help, but then it is still, again, all the other components, your clinical hours, your shadowing. Do you have the right courses, the, you know, the grades for those courses? Are you volunteering? Uh, your letters of recommendation, your personal statement, there's so much that goes in. So being a non-traditional doesn't count against you or it doesn't count against and help. It just, it's really the whole package. And then uh, Kezia asked, if you don't have a license and you do get a job as an MA, can you still give injections and do hands-on patient work? Um, yeah, there was no difference between me and anyone who had a license. The, you would have never, if you walked in our office, you would have no idea that um, like five of us don't have an MA license. Um, they just train you. The, they train you the same too, honestly. Um, maybe if you need more time, you can ask, but I could do everything that all the other MAs could do. Yeah, it's entirely up to the practice because the practice mm -hmm. is covering you under their malpractice. So it's whatever they feel comfortable letting you do, but there's no law that said you had to have an MA certification in order to give a, a back, uh, an injection. Mm -hmm. And that is all the questions we have. There's no more for me right now. Okay. Well, thanks everybody for joining. Um, if you want, we will provide a certificate for your attendance just just go on the Instagram page where we have the post and just leave a message letting us know where to email you. Or I guess we do have an email list, but just at least leave your name. If you want a certificate, happy to get that to you. We're trying to do these every two weeks. I do have one, I believe coming up on number 16th with a pediatrician or pediatric BA, sorry. And, you know, as we get them, we'll post them on Instagram. They're on our website as well. PAMentorOnline.com. We have a page for virtual shadow and we're trying to list the ones. And if you missed it or if your friends missed this, it's going to be posted on YouTube. You could watch it later. But thanks, everybody, for showing up. I appreciate it. And, of course, thank you, Sandra, for your time. Thank you. A lot of fun you. having you. Cassie, of course, thanks for all of your help. But Anytime. I'll be calling on you in about five or ten years, Cassie, to do one of these. Perfect. I would love to. <laughs> okay, you guys. Thanks, everybody, for joining us.